first worship at First United Methodist Church of Florence. I'm so happy you joined us. We're continuing our series on atomic discipleship, and today we're focusing on making our holy habits attractive. We hope you find something meaningful to help you with your journey of faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and for the ability to worship you. God, we're grateful to be in a relationship with you and with the others in our congregation and the others in our world. Lord, I pray that you guide this sermon, that you guide our hearts towards you, and that you direct our paths following. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. And now, let's turn our hearts towards God in worship. Corinthians 9 24 through 27 do you know that in a race the runners all compete but only one receives the prize run in such a way so that you may win it athletes exercise self-control in all things they do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable one so I do not run aimlessly nor do I box as though beating the air but I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others I myself should not be disqualified the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Every time I try to make it on my own, Every time I try to stand, I start to fall. All those lonely roads that I have traveled on, there was Jesus. When the life I built came crashing to the ground, when the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching In the healing, in the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, for forgiveness and a price I could Lord, I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken. shadows of all of the alleys. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. There my Jesus. There was Jesus. In the fire of the Lord. In the searching, in 
Travis Leach was nine years old the first time he saw his dad overdose, a scene which he witnessed several more times until he turned 16, dropped out of school, and moved away from home. He lost several minimum wage jobs because of his uncontrolled temper. Travis was always late for work if he showed up at all. When Travis felt overwhelmed by the amount of work he had to do, and his manager pressured him to work faster, his hands shook, his chest tightened, and he could hardly breathe. He felt like the whole world was pressing on his chest. He wondered if that was how his dad felt, overwhelmed by the demands of life, and maybe that could explain why his father started using drugs. One day, one of Travis's regular customers said he was opening up a new Starbucks and asked Travis to apply for a job. A month later, Travis was a barista at Starbucks. Six years later, at the age of 25, Travis managed two Starbucks, overseeing 40 employees, and was responsible for revenues exceeding $2 million a year. He was making $44,000 a year with a 401k and no debt. He was never late to work, and he never lost his temper. When an employee started crying after a customer screamed at her, Travis told her, your apron is a shield. Nothing anyone says can hurt you. You'll always be as strong as you need to be. Travis picked up this helpful advice as part of his Starbucks training, a program that begins on an employee's first day and continues throughout their career. Travis earned college credits by completing modules. Starbucks taught him how to live, focus, get to work on time, and master his emotions. Most importantly, they taught him willpower. Dozens of studies show that willpower is the single most important keystone habit for individual success. Remember, keystone habits are habits that automatically lead to multiple positive behaviors and positive results in your life. These habits spark chain reactions that help other good habits take hold. For Starbucks, developing willpower helps its employees regulate their emotions, increase their self-discipline, and become not only better employees, but better people. It's what allows them to take people like Travis, a drug addict son who dropped out of high school and lacked the necessary self-control to hold down a minimum wage job, and teaches them to manage their work more importantly, to manage their lives. A recurring trait of successful people is that they know how to get things done, but it's not just through external motivation, but it's through an internal guidance system built on determination, self-discipline, and self-control. They have the willpower to push through difficult challenges to achieve the most important things, it works on the job or in school, but it also works to deepen our relationship with God. Willpower is being able to control one's impulses and actions leading to desired outcomes. Willpower operates like a muscle, at least according to psychologist Roy F. Baumeister's research. He says willpower is strengthened with practice but it's also fatigued by overuse. Baumeister discovered that exercising willpower depletes glucose in the body. Therefore, eating and sleeping well are critical to maintaining self-control. We also have a limited amount of willpower that drains as we use it, and it needs replenishing. Spiritual disciplines are one of the ways that we develop our willpower, where we renew our resolve and increase our faithfulness as followers of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul understood our need for willpower in shaping our lives according to God's design for us. In our scripture reading, 
He uses a sports analogy to make his point about willpower, self-control, and perseverance. Whether we enjoy sports from our couch, from the stands at a football game, or while jogging on a running trail, Paul's words resonate with our experience and readily tap into our competitive emotions to serve as a metaphor for the life of faith. Paul says, Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Every race has only one winner. There are no medals for those who don't come in first. Paul says in living out our faith, we should strive to be like the victor. Notice though, the aim for Paul isn't finishing first, it's giving it our best shot. Then Paul says, athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we run the race to receive an imperishable one. Our race is not run merely to show our physical dominance. Our race prepares us for the challenges of persevering in the life of faith. So Paul continues, So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as those beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. The Christian, like an athlete, trains with one purpose in mind. Our determination and focus must fulfill a purpose lest we run aimlessly or vainly beat at the air as a boxer hitting nothing at all. Paul says willpower helps him overcome the senseless and meaningless efforts at living the life of faith, by focusing on the imperishable goal, that is, strengthening his witness so that others might be attracted to the life of faith. It's why he does everything he does, that is, to experience the joy of seeing other people living the life of faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the benefits of that abundant life. In verse 23 of the ninth chapter, he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. In James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, the second law of behavior change is make it attractive. For you see, the more attractive an opportunity is, the more likely it is to become habit-forming. Clear says there are some techniques we can use to increase the attractiveness of a new behavior. The first is what he calls temptation bundling. And this is where we pair an action we want to do with an action we need to do. For example, if I want to start jogging to get in shape, I might jog over to the convenience store to purchase a candy bar. In doing so, I've made the thing I need to do more appealing by pairing it with something I enjoy. Uh, however, I need to remember I'll, I'll have to run three additional 10-minute miles to burn off that candy bar. But a second technique is what he calls cultural influence. And this is related to the idea that we tend to imitate the habits of the close, that would be family and friends, the many our tribe, and the powerful, those with status and prestige. We're more likely to engage in behaviors that get us praise and approval. Therefore, we can use our social groups as motivation. One of the most effective ways to build better habits is to become a part of a culture that expects the desired behavior we want to add. So if I want to start jogging, it would help for me to join a running club. A third technique that Clear talks about is reframed thinking. And this is when we think in positive terms. We're more likely to create habits that stick by doing so. Especially if we're taking on a more difficult habit, it helps to reframe our thoughts around the behavior. For instance, instead of thinking, I have to go out for a jog, I can think, I get to go out for a jog. And that'll make a huge difference. Now, I want to give you a little bonus here. 
Eat nutritionally balanced meals and get seven to eight hours of sleep nightly in order to replenish your willpower. One of the reasons that dieting is so hard is because, as Baumeister said, that willpower depletes glucose. And so the very thing that we're cutting out of our, of our lives is what we need to exert willpower. But eating nutritionally balanced meals and getting sleep will help us achieve our goals. Now, that's about our bodies, but the Apostle Paul compared the life of faith and the discipline it takes to live it well with the rigors of physical training. In 1 Timothy, he wrote, Train yourselves in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. In his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Lives, the author Dallas Willard says that the people to whom Paul wrote knew full well the importance of physical training for effective performance. For centuries, people in the region recognized the role of a physical trainer who with his students was a familiar sight as they trained all around town. Everyone knew what it took to develop one's physical strength. In Paul's advice to Timothy, he points out that there's a parallel in the spiritual realm and emphasized how we should train ourselves in godliness. Just like physical conditioning, there are specific practices we can do to establish, maintain, and enhance our spiritual strength. One must train for the life of discipleship, as well as try to live faithfully. An athlete may have all the enthusiasm in the world and talk a good game, but talk does not win the race. Likewise, zeal without knowledge or practice to strengthen one's spirit is never enough. One must train wisely as well as intensely for spiritual formation. It's almost impossible in today's religious climate to appreciate just how unnecessary it was for Paul to explicitly say that Christians should spend time alone with God in solitude. Most Christians today tend to think of solitude as a fringe activity of an ancient few, or maybe even pagan, when in reality, solitude was a significant part of the devotional life of faithful first century Christians. Again, Dallas Willard says, to illustrate how spiritual practices or holy habits were integral to the life of the early Christians, Consider how Jesus and his disciples practiced solitude extensively. I've included some scripture references noting times when Jesus sought solitude in the outline, and I hope you'll refer to those. All who followed Jesus in the early church knew how important solitude was to him, and they imitated his example for centuries after his death. Why solitude? Solitude is the most radical of the disciplines for shaping one's spiritual life. Think about this. In prisons, solitary confinement breaks the strongest of wills. It's capable of this because it prevents interactions with others, a critical activity upon which our human existence depends. A life alienated from God collapses when deprived of its community. But a life in tune with God is nurtured by time spent alone with Him. It is solitude and solitude alone that opens the possibility of a radical relationship with God that can withstand all external circumstances up to and including death itself. Lexio Divina, 
Visio Divina and contemplative prayer are all forms of solitude that can strengthen our connection with God and strengthen our resolve to live faithfully. One of the things that helped me develop the practice of solitude is knowing that I'm engaging in a spiritual discipline in which Jesus himself engaged. That made it more attractive to me. Because if I live my life in the way he lived his, I will become more like Jesus. In Ephesians we read, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're going to spend another week with Visio Divina as our spiritual practice. We're going to use Luke's account of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, found in Luke 22, verses 39 through 46, as our scripture. But we're also going to use Duccio's painting, Agony in the Garden, as the image upon which we'll gaze. We'll post the instructions for doing Visio Divina again on our Facebook page. But let's remember that this is one of the ways that we train as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's work on developing these life-changing practices that recast us, that reshape us, that reform us in the image of our God as seen in the person of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We're so glad you were with us today. Remember to go to fumcflow.org and register your attendance. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.